welcome friends to the class of research design right. So, in the last lecture we had started with research design and I, as I said research design uh, is a blueprint a map to conduct a research right. It helps you to give an idea how you should be conducting the research so that a pre planning helps you to save your time and cost. If you are uh, uh, you know not clear with your research design then maybe maybe uh, why maybe there is a very large chance that you might create a very messy situation for yourself and the research will take un unnecessarily more time and the result might not be very uh, sound right. So, uh, in the last lecture we discussed about one of the types of research design which is the exploratory research design and today we will talk about the descriptive and the causal research design out of which are both together called the conclusive research design right. So, uh, the first one to start with is the descriptive research. So, descriptive research design is undertaken to describe as the name suggests you can understand to describe answers to questions of who, what, where, when and how. That means, who is going to use my product, what is his need, where is he uh, present, when does he need and how does he use my product for example. So, these are the 5 questions which you need to answer. So, descriptive research is a very very important part in the business research especially in marketing research we use a lot of uh, studies which need to understand which use the descriptive research uh, design right. So, it is desirable when we wish to project a studies finding to a larger population that means what you have conducted a let us say a test market right in a small place and now you are trying to use this knowledge of the test market that you have done let us say in a small place uh, in any small city or town to you want to replicate the uh, results of the test market to the larger audience for the whole country for example. So, in such a condition uh, this is highly appropriate. So, it says it is desirable when we wish to project a studies finding to a larger population if the study sample is the representative. Now, let us say you have made a study in let us say Delhi for example. So, if you want to replicate the uh, study in the whole of India it might be possible might not be possible right because Delhi is a metro and uh, all the cities in India are not as good as a metro. But suppose you have done a study in a let us say tier 2 city. So, a tier 2 city uh, there is a large possibility that the people around the country they are more closer to the tier 2 cities the people in the tier 2 cities their income group their you know their occupation their uh, earning abilities and all. So, this is what it talks about. So, it helps you to uh, create an external validity create a uh, project your study into the uh, for the larger population. So, what does it consist of it consists of two methods the survey method the first one. The survey method is the method where you create a survey instrument and try to take the opinion right you create a survey instrument and take the opinion and try to measure this right. And from this survey you try to come to a kind of a conclusion you, you infer something right. So, survey methods are very 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 popular methods. So, you ask questions to the people and their answers are recorded and this may be done uh, the survey can be done you know physically can be done online can be done telephonically. So, you can conduct any survey method and then you the results can be properly collected and then analyzed ok. The second is the observational method. Now, although observation seems to be a very easy word and uh, sometimes people might think ki what is so great about observing, but observing sometimes tells you more than what even survey cannot say why. Because when you observe use the observational method you are trying to observe the uh, customer or the consumer in a space where he is free and he is trying to he or she is is behaving very normally. But during a survey method sometimes it is not possible because the the customer or the respondent becomes little more uh, you know attentive or little more uh, you know vigil and uh, kind of a uh, he is uh, becoming little more you can say what do you say how do you explain that. So, he is becoming little more attentive you can understand that way right. So, uh, but on observational method you are observing him in a space and time where he is free and he is behaving to his natural self ok. So, that is why observational methods can also be good and very uh, useful. So, you may use uh, just an observational method through a video you know through a through a camera or you can use some observational method like today uh, companies are using researcher is using like you know 
uh, machines right machines and instruments to find out your palpitation rate your you know pupil pupillometer so these devices are used to measure the change in your body right and then see ki the whether this changes what do they mean by uh, you know what do they mean suppose a customer is getting uh, is getting a higher palpitation does it mean that he is uh, getting more interested for this project uh, product or service or uh, he uh, is uh, get some kind of a emotional change is happening in it so what is this happening right so this is uh, sometimes uh, very largely also used in marketing researches so uh, how do you classify the descriptive research now there are two ways of doing it one is the cross sectional studies and the other is the longitudinal so cross sectional you can understand like a horizontal study longitudinal you can understand like a vertical study right so it's horizontal this is vertical now what does it mean so it says cross sectional studies measure units from a sample of the population at only one point in time or a snapshot so that means you are collecting from a set of respondents only once so through a survey you are collecting the respondents opinion only for once right so this is uh, maybe uh, at a time period of let's say 6 months or a year so uh, you try to collect this information sample surveys are cross sectional studies sample surveys right so some kind of sample respondents whose samples are drawn in such a way as to be representative of a specific population so when you are trying to study on a sample so the sample what is the definition of sample is the sample uh, is defined as something that is a true representative of the population what is it saying a sample is a part of the population that truly represents the population okay so when you select a sample that means it is reflecting the population it is representing the population so so you are you are when you are doing a survey or a study you are doing a cross sectional study on the uh, sample right similarly cross sectional studies are usually presented with a margin of error why there could be a margin of error because since you are only collecting the response only one point of time at at a only once right so there could be a problem of response bias or a non response bias right so uh, if it is a uh, if they are responding differently or they are not responding so there could be a bias that can come so that is why we say there is a there you have to go with a margin of error but it has its own advantages because it helps you to collect the data in a uh, in a shorter period of time right and make the uh, research process more feasible and uh, practical right on the other hand the other study is the longitudinal way it is what it says is longitudinal studies repeatedly measure the same sample units of a population over time so you are measuring the same sample units time and again that means once twice thrice the same people the same respondents okay a longitudinal design differs from a cross sectional design in that the sample or samples remain the same they don't change right why is it done why is it done it is done so because if you change the sample then the entire opinion might change right so if i let's say you are talking about the uh, you know the the performance of a product and you have asked the person for the first time if you change that person suppose you get a fresh person his opinion might be completely different but suppose we ask the same person the second time then he would say ki whether the product's performance has been same over the last year like the last year or it is different in this year so this difference in change over the years he can tell if he the same sample we are using or she the, the same sample we are using right same respondent so that is why uh, the longitudinal studies are very imp important and they are uh, largely utilized in economic related studies so there are two types continuous uh, panels in longitudinal studies continuous panels where panel members or the members in the panel that means a panel is a group of uh, members right panel members are asked the same questions on each panel measurement so where different studies are conducted but the panel members are asked the same question again and again so fixed sample of respondents measured repeatedly but this is a continuous panel but there is a discontinuous panel now discontinuous panels vary questions from one panel measurement to the next that means what is saying these are sometimes referred to as omnibus panel 
in order to maximize in order to maximize the breadth of information sometimes the researcher is interested to ask more number of diverse questions so that the respondent can give him or her opinion. These respondents are chosen on a very systematic manner that means they are chosen with lot of seriousness this uh, samples are selected right. So, it has been uh, taken care of that they are not a biased sample right. So, when you vary these questions from one panel measurement to the next this is the case of a discontinuous panel. So, what it is saying is the panel members are the may be the same the questions are varying now right. Discontinuous panels are demographically matched to some larger entity implying representativeness. So, that means what? So, we are using those the panel members they are similar to the po population you know demographic characteristics. Okay. Discontinuous panels represent sources of information that may be quickly accessed for a wide variety. Sometimes as I said you need a breadth of questions and a wide variety of questions and their answers right. In order to meet those questions and answers right you uh, may be you have selected your audience well and then you want to keep them and you want to just change in the questions. So, that is where we discontinuous panel comes into play right. Now, example of a continuous panel. So, you have understood the continuous panel. So, the same members right studies examining this is a case of a brand switching study. So, do people change their brand or are they loyal to the brand? So, this study can be done through a continuous panel method. So, studies examining how many consumers switched their brands. So, sometimes if you look at the numbers, the numbers might not tell you exactly, but if you see ki whether from if the total number might be the same, but if the change in the brand has happened and within the brand the, the total number of people are the same let us say, but there has been a change within the brand that means they have moved from one brand to the other, but the total remains the same let us say. So, in that condition a brand switching uh, you know study helps to understand why people have switched a brand and what is the reason behind it right. Similarly, market tracking studies those that measure variables of interest such as market share or unit sales over time. So, in such a condition the continuous panel studies are used where the go back and see what is saying. So, the continuous panel the same panel members are asked the questions on each panel measurement same panel members right. So, this is what we discussed about the uh, descriptive research. So, we have uh, understood the research design we started with the exploratory research design then we understood ki what are the types of uh, you know methods in the exploratory research design, then we understood what is a uh, conclusive research design and within the conclusive research design what are the types of conclusive research design and among these we have two types of research design, one is the descriptive research design and the descriptive research design is used to understand things like who, what, when, where, how etcetera and it describes the market characteristics right. That is a part of the conclusive, but there is one more and uh, research design which is very very important right. So, what is this? this? This research design is called the experimentation or we say the causal research the causal right. The causal research design is largely and largely considered to be a experimentation case that means you are experimenting may be it is in a lab or it is with the people or anything. So, are experimenting. So, there is a possible cause and effect relationship. Okay. So, what is this experimentation? We all have heard of experimentation since our childhood. We have been doing experiment in the chemistry lab, we have done some biological experiments, we have done experiments in the physics uh, you know uh, lab also. So, uh, we have done experiments right. So, what are these experiments and how it is uh, applicable to the marketing research? Let us see. So, let us see a case of a real research. So, I am starting with this case this is a case of pay what you want pricing this is one of the uh, cases uh, this research problems which I am myself involved at the moment one of my research scholars is working on this concept of pay what you want. Now, you must have heard of this is very interesting because you must have heard of uh, pricing for example, the MRP right a fixed price which is set up by the seller right the manufacturer or the seller, but what if the price instead of uh, is uh, starts getting fixed by the uh, decided by the uh, buyer and not the seller. So, it was a case that we have till today we have never ever thought of that prices can be fixed by buyers right. It has always and always been that 
price has been fixed by the seller because the, he is the one who produces the product right. But what if we take the buyer into uh, cognizance and we understand and we allow the buyer to fix the price, what happens in such a condition? Will it work? Will it not work? What will happen? See, the question is why do we have a MRP or a fixed price or a price for that a maximum retail price is that because we feel that if a price is set then the company understands ki well within this price I can make this much of profit the my distribution chain can make this much of profit and the customer gets at this price. So, everybody can be kept happy, but suppose that means what we are trying to fix up. So, when you fix up a price there is a there is a dual situation one the price may be a overpriced case or the price could be underpriced case. So, you can never say suppose the value x that you fit in for a price this price can sometimes be considered as an overpriced case for some, by some consumers or it could be thought of as an undervalued price for some consumers right. So, if it is a overpriced consumers uh, it is a overpriced case still it is a loss because consumers will feel you are cheating them. If it is underpriced then you could have, you have lost a potential of earning more and you have lost that opportunity. So, the case is how do you decide? So, suppose we put it leave it on the buyer we leave it on the buyer then this problem of under and overpriced is gone, but then a new problem comes up what is this the buyer suppose you say pay whatever you want that means you can pay whatever you like the consumer is free to pay whatever it likes in such a condition somebody would argue why would a consumer pay at all. So, the question here is that means we are coming with a hypothesis we are we are moving with a hypothesis that consumers will tend to cheat and they would not pay at all this is a hypothesis which we have made up in our mind, but that is can be grossly and grossly wrong right. Because some companies some organizations have tried this process of pay, pay what you want where they have allowed the consumers the buyers to decide their price right and they have not interfered into it. And luckily the result has been not so bad, but rather it has been profitable right. So, for example, in India there is a case of uh, uh, there is a uh, there is a hotel Seva cafe for example, Seva cafe right uh, or even Wikipedia for that they do not charge you anything correct. So, how do they survive? So, it survives on uh, the buyers interest sometimes the buyers donate they pay something right in sub, suppose something like this Seva cafe right. So, what is this it is the concept is that you go and you consume the product and you pay a price that you feel like, but your whatever you have consumed already somebody has paid the price for it. So, you are going to pay for somebody who is coming into the future in the future to this place. So, this mechanism of uh, having this kind of a price can be very interesting and sometimes it could be uh, you know uh, more profitable just take in case of an uh, I am not uh, comparing it, but I am just giving example just imagine when it comes to charity or donations to temples and uh, uh, religious institutions or even donations to uh, organizations of for needy people. Sometimes I have seen and we have all seen that people are uh, very uh, very benevolent they uh, they open up their heart and they donate like anything right. Maybe the number is less maybe only 30 percent or 20 percent, but then this 20 percent they that those who pay they pay so high that it covers up the cost for the entire uh, 100 percent and even allows the companies to make profit right. So, look at the temples for example, in India they are flooded with money who has given them. So, the it is only this 10 percent people because 90 percent people they go and they have food free of cost sometimes even they are uh, allowed to stay free of cost. So, this money that is covered up is from those people's money who have donated right. So, this this mechanism can be tested in also on the practical uh, life in our real time life and seen ki whether this mechanism can work or not. Some companies have done it and they are uh, doing it well right. So, experimentation. So, this has to be experimented now we are experimenting with uh, different kinds of products for example, we have uh, tested with commodities how uh, people will react in case of commodities how people will react in case of luxury goods how people will react to handmade goods right. So, we are uh, we have done some of the experiments uh, experiments and our results uh, we have uh, now published in some of the in one of the journals right. And uh, we have interestingly found that uh, 
pay what you want has been more it can be beneficial uh, for the seller right. So, what is this experimentation commonly used to infer causal relationships. So, look at this interesting the scientist right he is so happy. So, he is trying to put in some things some chemicals and trying to see whether uh, what is the uh, result that will come right. So, the same thing here in the business uh, arena or the market we are trying to see how it will have an effect ok. The concept of causality as defined in marketing research now what is this causality and how it is defined in marketing research let us see. Causality applies causality cause and effect applies when the occurrence of x increases the probability of the occurrence of y. So, what is my y? y is my dependent variable right x is my independent variable. So, what we are saying here is that the occurrence of x the presence or the occurrence of x it increases the probability of the occurrence of y if x is there then x, x increases y increases if x increases y might decrease but whatever it is the presence of x will change the presence of y right. So, this is what happens for example, I will give I, uh, ok let us understand in the market for example, the most classical example given is the advertisement and sales. So, if my sales is my dependent variable, so the occurrence of sales sales is affected by the presence of advertisement. So, advertisements presence in different categories or conditions will have a different effect on the sales right. So, this is what uh, we talk about as causality right. Now, how do you understand what is uh, this is something like the layman uh, layman term and this is the scientific right. So, in the for the layman he says x is the only cause of y for a layman or a just general person y is caused by x, but scientifically we cannot say that the scientist would say x is only one of the number of possible causes of y because we cannot mention we cannot be 100 percent sure that we have found out all the possible causes. So, we will say x is only one such possible cause of y. Okay. Second x must always lead to y. So, x must always lead to y, but scientifically when we say what we say the occurrence of x makes the occurrence of y more probable. So, the probability increases we cannot say always lead to y, but it is we say the probability of this happening is more it increases. Okay. Third it is possible to prove that x is a cause of y x is a cause of y, y is the dependent x is the independent. In fact, the scientific community will realize that we can never prove that x is a cause of y at best we can infer that x is a cause we can only infer I say that I infer that x might be the cause of, of y, but I cannot say I cannot prove that x is only the cause of y it is very very difficult all the time to prove. Yes, you might you can say that, but you cannot always all the time you cannot prove it right. What are the conditions for the cause and effect studies? Before making a causal inference or assuming causality three conditions must be satisfied there are three conditions. Today I will explain these three conditions and we will stop right. The first is the concomitant variation, the second is time order of occurrence of variables and the third is elimination of other possible causal factors. So, what is this concomitant variation right these conditions are necessary, but not sufficient to demonstrate causality they are necessary, but not sufficient. So, what are these three? So, concomitant variation I will just brief you a condition for inferring causality that requires that the extent to which a cause x and an effect y occur together or vary together is predicted by the hypothesis under condition consideration sorry. So, do not worry just look at the example what is saying sales and amount of advertisement. So, I just said what is says a condition for inferring causality that requires that the extent to which a cause x and then y occur together or vary together that means, they both vary together. So, if this varies automatically this also varies it is like a seesaw ok. Similarly, customer retention and service quality if my service quality is good my customer retention may be high 
if my customer service quality is poor my retention may be low ok. So, evidence pertaining to concomitant variation can be obtained in a qualitative or quantitative manner. Now, look at this case <coughs> this is very uh, you see suppose your car is making some funny noise when you are putting on the acceleration uh, on acceleration right. So, you might take your foot of the pedal. So, you when you accelerated what happened there is a funny noise coming. So, you, you took out your foot and try to see ki whether the noise is staying or it is going away. So, this is the qualitative way of understanding ki what how are they varying together that means, with the speed acceleration is the noise also increasing or it is going down it is a qualitative way of understanding ok. Consider a random sample of 1000 respondents regarding purchase of fashion clothing from department stores right. So, there are 1000 respondents and their uh, you know, interest for fashion clothing is given to you. Respondents have been classified into high and low education groups high and low education groups based on some median value. The table below I will show you this one right suggests that the purchase of fashion clothing is influenced by education level. The purchase is in of clothing fashion clo fashion fashionable clothing right not ordinary clothing is influenced by the education level possible. So, respondents with high education are more likely to purchase more fashion clothing. Now, look at look at this education is high education is low purchase is high purchase is low. So, high education and high purchase 73 percent high education and low purchase of fashion clothing is only 27 percent. So, that means, we can say that if my education level is high my purchase of fashion clothing is high education is low and purchasing is high is 64 percent. So, that but that is not uh, this contradictory. So, how do what we do we uh, understand from here. So, you see what you can understand is this. So, based on this evidence can we conclude that high education causes a high purchase of fashion clothing was the question no not at all. All that can be said is that association makes the hypothesis more tenable it does not prove it why because although it is showing that with the education your fashion clothing buying is increasing, but it may be possible that the other possible factors could be income for example, fashion clothing can be expensive. So, people with higher incomes may be more able to afford them and higher incomes are generally associated with higher education level. So, it is possible that considering a third variable will criticize crit crystallize an association that was originally obscure the time order of the occurrence of variables provides additional insights into causality. So, you cannot say only one. So, there could be some other factors which can uh, be responsible. Well, what I will do is I will stop the lecture here right and uh, uh, we will go back. So, uh, maybe in the next class again we will start uh, with this. So, we have only covered the concomitant variation the other two uh, will start in the next lecture and we will go uh, into the types of experimentation and the different types of experimental uh, designs uh, that is possible in a uh, in a business study or a marketing research study we will do that right. So, I hope uh, you have understood uh, what has been uh, discussed in this lecture. So, thank you very much.